Hello and welcome to another episode of Bonus. This time, I have something rather unusual for you. Uh, it's a game called Nubby Nubby Boy for the PS3. Well, I, I, I say it's a game. It's a little bit... Uh, it's unusual. Let's just leave it at that. You play uh, a boy who can stretch and then that's the game. You stretch around things and, and make yourself long. It's, it's Japanese. It's weird. I was planning on doing a video on the nature of games and... Uh, it's been done before, but you know, like an explosion of games which some people think aren't games. Stuff like Proteus, uh, Gone Home, and this, Nobby Nobby Boy, which is, it's, like I say, it, it's interactive entertainment, I'll give it that much. But there's not much of a game to it. But I think the, uh, the Titanfall DNA episode, that shunted that idea out of the way. Principally because I'm never sure, you know, how well a video idea is going to do, and I wanted to establish more of an identity for the Game DNA series, because I may very well revisit that in the future. But it's on the drawing board. I feel like I haven't done any videos in a while, but I have been busy, I promise you. I was ill for a week, and then I've been playing Titanfall a, a bit. Well, quite a lot, in fact. But I have been busy. I have definitely been working. Uh, I've just finished the Easter egg video. In fact, I finished it a few days ago. It's already uploaded. It's ready to go. But somebody pointed out in the comments of the bonus last week that the video on Easter eggs would make a great April Fool's Day video. It's not really a joke video. In fact, it's a very serious video. But there are some elements of humour in it. So I thought, yeah, you know what? That is a good idea. I'm going to save the Easter egg video for April the 1st. It's a good video. And I think if you've liked my recent output, then you'll probably like this one as well. And there is also a fiendishly well-hidden easter egg in there, which fills me with delight. But yeah, uh, next in production is the Titanfall stuff. And I'm spending some time with Titanfall because I want to do it properly. I want to gently caress it and become intimate with the game. And do a really nice, comfy guide that's entertaining not only for those who are playing the game, but for, for, you know, for those who liked the, the Black Ops style of things. You know, with the comforting sounds and the clicks and the whirs. That's the kind of thing I'm going for. Anyway, I'm sure there are some comments that I'll pick about Titanfall anyway, so we'll talk about that more later. I'm trying to get back into a regular production schedule, and when I have like a series concept to go ahead with, like the Titanfall, when, when all the graphics are put together, I should hopefully be able to find a weekly stride. It seems like everything's been in a bit of a state of upheaval of late, or well, with my illness a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my cat is very ill at the minute as well. Uh, Ted is suffering from anemia, which isn't good. So we've been to the vets a few times already, and I'm going again this afternoon. I think at the moment we're trying to ascertain whether it's non-regenerative uh, anemia or regenerative anemia. Uh, the latter, I think, is the preferable one, because with the course of antibiotics and steroids to suppress his immune function, I think it'll be alright. If it's non-regenerative anemia, then, well, it might be something more serious. It could be something affecting his bone marrow. So that's some bad news, and, well, clearly that's been taking up some of my time. I'll, I'll be sure to keep you in the loop. You know, make sure when he's okay. If he's okay, I'll let you know. But he seems to be doing okay. He's alert, he's still eating, he's still using the litter tray, he's drinking, he's doing all the normal cat things. It's just, he doesn't have quite enough blood. Because um, his body's destroying red blood cells for some reason. But he has improved over the last couple of days, so hopefully he'll continue to, to get better. So yeah, bad news. But I hope to have some good news for you. Um, I'm getting married in April. So there's that. Nothing fancy at all, we're just having a very basic ceremony. It's, it's really more, it's less about having a wedding and more about just getting married, really, for the sake of it, because we've been together so long. Anyway, I won't dwell on the, uh, the personal details of my, my relationship, but yeah, we're getting married. And this does mean, unfortunately, bad news that I will miss a bonus, obviously, for the honeymoon. <laughs> so, on the 23rd of April, no bonus. Awfully sorry about that. Well, so that's, uh, wow, so that's, that's bad news, good news, bad news. That's uh, an awful lot to take in. Sorry about that. Let's get on with the questions. Captain Krill says, Stu, you talked late last year about doing Battlefield 4 and Forza 5 guides prior to Titanfall's launch, but instead focused on other, more general videos. I know there were no promises, but I'm curious what led to your decision to change your video schedule in that way. You know, I was very, very close. Very close indeed to doing a Forza 5 video. In between the cracks of all of my other videos, I actually spent a bit of time writing a script, doing some research, even planning some graphics and recording some gameplay footage for a 4 to 5 video. But all of these things, they, they were kind of put together over the course of a few weeks. And uh, I had everything in place and I came to the edit process to put everything together and I realised I deleted all my gameplay because I needed the space. 
So that scuppered the whole project and I carried on working on whatever was next. Um, but that does mean I've actually got a complete script and complete voiceover for a Forza 5 video. Now it wasn't very long, it was only about four minutes long, but it was it was well written, it was scripted, and it was it was pretty interesting. So I may resurrect that one. Um, it would be a bit odd just having a random Forza 5 video in the middle of nowhere. But you know what? It, it might work. It might work. It might not. I don't care if it doesn't. You know, no harm, no foul. But uh, yeah, I might resurrect that one and actually deliver it. Because I might as well, because well, writing the script's the hardest part, and that's already done. As for Battlefield 4, I did kind of... I promised myself that I'd do at least one Battlefield 4 video in the time that I had, but... I don't know, I, I just found myself diverted by more interesting projects. Coming out of the Ghost series, I, I guess I didn't want to just do another weapon guide. I wanted to do something a little bit more special. But uh, I guess, internally, all of the ideas I came up with just sounded less appealing than the other stuff that I had planned. Like the game DNA concept, I really wanted to test that, see if it would work. Uh, the, the iconic arms concept as well, I'm glad I tested that because that does seem to have worked really well. And then there's my brief history format, which I actually really like doing that. I'm actually, I think the videos that are produced on that end are quite satisfying. And they're quite interesting, I think. At least to me, that's the sort of video I would like to watch on YouTube. So the, the idea of doing a guide several months out from Battlefield 4's launch, just like a pedestrian guide on the game, I don't know, it didn't fill me with joy. Anyway, this is how, this is how video plans get diverted. They get shunted out of the way by other ideas, changing circumstances. Illness, I suppose, as well, to a certain degree. And I kind of feel as though if I were to do a Battlefield 4 video today, it would just be for the sake of appeasing those who want a Battlefield 4 video, which isn't necessarily bad, but right now, I'd rather be playing Titanfall. Grupse says, uh, What do you think of Tom Clancy's The Division? Personally, I can't wait. Uh, the pre-release trailers look good, but I don't know, it remains to be seen whether the final game resembles those trailers, because there's a pretty good chance that it won't. So I'm reserving judgement until we've got a release date, until we've got a finalised game, and until, you know, there's, there's some acclaim or some decent reception for it. Totally not a troll says, Hey Stu, are you going to do Titan for weapon guides for only pilot weapons or Titan weapons too? I'm going to start with the pilot weapons, and then after that, depending on reception, we'll see about extending Titanfall content. It's definitely a possibility, and the fact that there are only 10 pilot weapons and I think 6 Titan weapons, that's a good thing. I think 16 episodes, I think, is doable. But we'll take it as it comes. If I mean, if I invest a lot of effort into this Titanfall series and it turns out they get no views, then obviously I'll divert into something else. Legit Scope says, Hey Stu, what's your favourite ice cream flavour? Mint Choc Chip. Model Omega says, Do you ever go on tvtropes.org? Well, yes I do. It's a very valuable resource, certainly for some of the videos I've been doing lately. It's essentially a list of media, you know, film, television, video games, uh, grouped by cliché. So if you wanted to look up um, video games that contain dual wielding, for instance, it's an invaluable resource because it, it just gives you a rundown. I think there's a page for ludicrous jibs as well, stuff like that. So it's, it's a really useful resource just for rounding out your own research. I'm also a big fan of The Cutting Room Floor. That's a fantastic site as well. It's got a whole bunch of content that's cut from games. All sorts of secret stuff. It's wonderful. And of course, the IMFDB is another invaluable resource. That's the uh, IMFDB, or Firearms Database, not the IMDB. If you ever want to know what specific variant of a specific gun featured in a video game or film, well, that's the site to go to. La Gon says, Do you think single-player Titanfall campaign would have been worth it? The thing about Titanfall and its uh, amount of content is that it feels incredibly spartan. The game is crystal clear, it's a diamond, it's perfect. But in its perfect simplicity, there's not much breadth to it. I'm not sure if single-player is the answer, I mean it is at its core a multiplayer game, but I do feel as though it needs something. Maybe a cooperative mode, you know, like a PvE, uh, where you just sort of shoot robots and enemy titans. I would like to see more in-depth customization and uh, a metagame on the back end of that, you know, like camouflage on locks, that sort of thing. I can kind of see there's a certain degree of coolness in burn cards, but I don't think the implementation's 100% there. So yeah, I don't know, like I say, the core of the game, absolutely perfect, but I do think there does need to be a lot added on. Well, I suppose that's what Titanfall 2 is for. 
Joseph Knott says stew, dairy milk, or galaxy? This is actually kind of a tough question. Uh, dairy milk is Cadbury's uh, chocolate offering, and galaxy is from Mars. They're probably the two sort of leading brands of chocolate in the UK, with dairy milk some, some distance ahead, I think. Forced to choose, I'd probably pick dairy milk, but I would miss Galaxy's creaminess. Uh, no Limit Gaming says, Are you going to generate or prestige in Titanfall? I have been doing so, yes. Um, because, you know, I've been playing just to learn the game, learn the maps and get good. I'm currently on Gen 3, and uh, I expect I can probably get away with Gen Upping uh, without too much interference to any weapon guides, because most, stuff's, it, most stuff is unlocked relatively early. There is the issue of regen requirements, because in order to regenerate you do need to fulfil certain criteria. And, you know, that means there are some annoying challenges, there are some grindy things you have to do. But, when you get to Gen 5, there's um, what's called the Gooser Challenge, for which you have to kill people while they're in the air ejecting. 50 times. That's, uh, th that's gonna be a tough one. In fact, I can see myself being stuck at the top of Gen 5 for a long time. So that's probably where I'll end up recording most of my weapon guides, and, you know, because I'll be stuck, I'll have everything unlocked, so it's not a big deal. Maybe I'll finish the challenge, maybe I'll make it to Gen 10. I don't know, but, you know, I'm having fun with the game. Cookie the Epic says, What do you think about indie games that could be deemed pretentious? Thomas Was Alone, Gone Home, and the Stanley Parable pop into mind as examples. In my opinion, these games have merit, but it's often found in portions that might be secondary to what the game is trying to do. Thomas Was Alone had a perfect soundtrack, for example. Except Gone Home. There's nothing good about Gone Home. Well, one man's pretension is another man's charm, so... I guess as long as someone's enjoying a game, it has at least some merit. I did find Thomas Was Alone quite charming. I mean, at its core, it's a basic puzzle platformer. But, yeah, you know, it's, it was pretty easy. It had some voice acting that was, you know, of a moderate standard. And the, the graphics were simplistic, but again, added to its charm, I suppose. However, I will say that I have started to play Thomas Was Alone, but I never finished it. Take that as you will. The Stanley Parable, I thought was quite compelling for about three or four hours, and then it lost all appeal to me. Again, I think the narration was an interesting way of adding kind of a human touch to what could otherwise have been a, a barren experience, and the voice acting was good, and in places it was charming. It was funny almost, which is a difficult thing to be. But... Yeah, once you've exhausted all the possible endings and all the all the possible routes, the game does quickly lose its appeal, so it it is of limited longevity. I'd say the same thing about Gone Home as well. I actually enjoyed Gone Home for what it's worth, but I was done with it in about an hour and a half, two hours. And so I certainly wouldn't recommend paying full price for it, because it, well, it just isn't worth it. I think I got it on sale, and I, I paid the princely sum of around £5, which I'm okay with, you know. I, I had enough out of it, you know, to justify that, I feel. But then, as I've mentioned in previous videos, I really love games in which you can rummage through people's stuff. Baggy Cheese says, So, Stu, Dandy or Beano? Well, much to my shame, I used to get both. Maybe not every week, but I did like to mix it up. I think, overall, though, given the preference, I'd probably take the Beano. Generally speaking, it was of a higher standard. F35 Flyer says, I was going to recommend doing Goat Simulator 2014 for the April 1st video, but it comes out April 1st. Well, you can always cover a decade old tile. Quick 3. Do you know, I kind of like the idea of doing a... Look, there's a goat in the video. There's a goat riding me. Please don't take that quote out of context. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, the idea of doing a Goat Sim video does actually quite appeal. I might consider doing this. I might slip it in between Titanfall just for a lark. Sticking to one series, man, that's overrated. I should be more whimsical. I should do crazy things. And maybe I will. Do you know, as far as doing decade-old games, I think I'm at the position now where I can justifiably start doing Game Over on my main channel. I think I'd quite like to bring it back. I might drop the Game Over appellation. I might just call the series Retro Hoy. But it'll be on my main channel. And uh, yeah, it'll be pretty much the same thing. Just, you know, maybe tightened up a little bit. Chris Tomo says, How do you feel about Bullfrog? What's been your past experience with them? For me, when I was growing up and getting to know more PC games, Dungeon Keeper, Magic Carpet, Theme Park slash Hospital, and Syndicate are the ones that stick out the most. I played Populous a lot later on, but still loved it. 
I'm pretty sad about the bullfrog going all those years ago, and EA taking over the Dungeon Keeper name and using it as a poor mobile game with microtransactions. I spent an awful lot of time with bullfrog games back in the day. I think my very first was Populous 2. I think that was in 1992? I was never really interested in the, uh, the competitive aspect of it, the actual game where you're facing off against another god. I just liked building things. I just liked flattening land and making a, a vast empire. For some reason, that was the most compelling part. Other than that, uh, Theme Park was another one I spent a lot of time with on my Amiga 1200. I've probably got thousands of hours sunk between those two titles. Other than that, uh, money was a bit limited for me when I was a kid, you know, you only get so much pocket money, so I probably would have liked to have bought a few more games by them. I had a demo for Syndicate, and I liked that an awful lot, but I never had the full game back in the day. It's only recently I've, I've played the whole thing. Sadly, I was rather dogged in my clinging to my Amiga, because I loved that system so dearly. I was such a fanboy of the Amiga, I clung to it right until about 1998, when I got my first PC. So I missed out a few Bullfrog games, 96, 97, when I still had an Amiga and everyone had stopped supporting it. So you see, this is what fanboyism does, it just means you miss out on games. Funnily enough, I was, uh, I was a PC fanboy for the next decade. It was Halo 2 and Gears of War that was the breaking point for me, I just thought, you know what, you know what, I'm gonna carry on gaming on my PC, but I'm gonna get an Xbox 360 as well. Anyway, there was one other Bullfrog game that I played an awful lot of on my PC, and that was Dungeon Keeper 2. I picked that up, I think it was in the year 2000, 2001. Again, at this point, I was a poor student. I didn't have much money, so I could only really afford budget games. I did buy a few, but I picked up Dungeon Keeper 2 for cheap, and I, I enjoyed that one an awful lot. That was good. So yeah, much love for Bullfrog. And I guess it is kind of sad, you know, that they're a, a shell of their former selves, but, you know, nothing lasts forever. It's safe to say that Bullfrog aren't really in a position to produce great games anymore, and so what? It's fine. It, their time has passed. There are great developers out there now making games, and 20 years from now people will, will be lamenting their loss, but it doesn't matter. Everything's impermanent. So I think people get, you know, kind of hung up on EA exploiting the Bullfrog name on stuff like the, uh, the Dungeon Keeper reboot for mobile. I've never played it. I have no interest in playing a mobile version of Dungeon Keeper. I really don't, so I'm not going to play it. It's always a shame to see your nostalgia being kicked in the stomach, but it's the harsh truth. Bullfrog doesn't really exist anymore, and they're not going to come back and produce games like they used to. I think it's an important part of growing up, you know, accepting the impermanence of things. Because a lot of the time, when you grow up with stuff, you expect that it's going to be the same forever. But as the years roll by, obviously things change and eventually things die. And it's always sad. But you should focus on remembering the good part of life, on the, the part that you enjoyed, because that's the part that has value. The fact that it's ended is ultimately of no real consequence. It's the journey and not the destination. Wreck says, uh, Pope sitting or standing? What sort of monster would stand? I bet they put the milk in first as well. Bryn Davies says, Stu, what is your favourite common lager? Okay, so common as in basically available in a typical pub. Uh, to be honest, when it comes to commercial lagers, they are all pretty much exactly the same. I mean, they're not exactly the same, but if you were to pour me, say, you know, a selection of eight different pints, or even two different pints of different brands, and make me drink them blind, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you which was which. Whereas, you know, something like uh, Coke versus Pepsi, I could tell you blind which is Coke and which is Pepsi. I'm not going to claim to have a, a super advanced palate, but I can tell the difference between things. Just not really commercial lager, not all that much. That being said though, there is a very subtle difference between the commercial offerings, and some of them are slightly better than others. I've been drinking a lot of lager recently, uh, because I've got a huge stockpile from the lager video I made for my Drinks Ahoy channel. Of the canned lager I've had recently, the standouts probably include uh, San Miguel. It's a little bit more delicate than some offerings. Cronenberg uh, isn't too bad either, that's okay. And one of the better canned lagers I've had, although it's admittedly not commonly seen on tap here, is the Polish lager called Tiski. So they're kind of top of the commercial tree, at least to my taste, but they are not spectacular. Still, having said that, lager is a very refreshing beer. It's, you know, it's, it's very popular for a reason. It's just not a very interesting beer. 
Anyway, we're approaching 20 minutes and my footage is coming to an end, so I shall wrap up this bonus. Next up, time for guides. Uh, they'll start as soon as they're ready. I'm in no major rush. And the Easter egg video, which I know I promised last week, has been pushed to the 1st of April. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, farewell.